Hello all, and this video is going to really wrap up with one of the central texts in the empiricist uh, tradition, at least in the turn of the uh, midway point of the last century, I would say for sure, and its influence towards ethics and uh, philosophy, especially with regards to metaphysics, which is what A.J. Ayer is going to set uh, by um, critiquing and uh, really eliminating what philosophy had been prior with a speculative, deductive, metaphysical um, inquiry, if you will, or a scheme or a system uh, created, um, which of course, if you, know, you asked him with regards to um, you know, Kant's distinction between um, what we as humans uh, are able to bring to the table of experience and how you know, we can't have any sort of knowledge of an a priori uh, reality. For him, it's uh, tautological. Um, and so we cannot really know of any sort of speculative system and therefore would eliminate um, not just any sort of discussion on you know God or a creator but um, in how you know metaphysical philosophy uh, mistakenly would afford us knowledge of a transcendental world um, for air of course this is uh, his antith antithesis, if you will, uh, and he wants to keep things within common sense and uh, the sciences in that empirical fashion. And so in the early chapter here, he wants to, or in uh, language, truth, and logic, he wants to, you know, look at how, you know, these speculative systems such as uh, Descartes in the early meditations or someone like Spinoza and having this um, logical knowledge of it um, can be you know, eliminated for um, the reality encountered under science and uh, common sense. Now interesting enough um, as we'll move on with, you know, metaphysical discussions here. It is interesting to see what, you know, becomes of metaphysics really um, in philosophy after A.J. Ayer uh, attempts to eliminate it. And I think, you know, one of the examples would be, you know, someone like Whitehead who, you know, he doesn't have a sort of transcendental uh, first principle with his metaphysics but nonetheless, he's using common sense. He's using, um, you know, generalizations that come out of um, scientific consensus, and that's how he comes towards his schema of um, the nature of uh, events. And so you can see, or as we will see, you know, this sort of metaphysical schema of you know, events that were you know, naturally observed in a scientific observation and using that generalization for a metaphysics of you know, reality as Whitehead does within um, you know, his idea of the event, which of course uh, goes from God and uh, on downward through um, those sort of ideas. And so there's other metaphysics as well with regards to you know, the medieval way of analogy, uh, the classic example of there being a hierarchy of being and, you know, properties in that sort of speculative sense are different degrees of, um, you know, its creation or of God. And so you could see that, you know, there's a metaphysics um, as a sort of uh, coordinating analogy if you looked at it uh, in that sort of historical sense of 
metaphysical schemes and their transformations. Um, uh, Stefan Pepper actually would, in, instead of a coordinating analogy, would look at how root metaphors uh, for a scheme that is used as a unifier, such as you know I and experience. Um, and he uses that uh, as an analogy or um, or a metaphor in this case towards you know different epochs of thought with regards to the organ uh, the organismic metaphor um, or if you like the coordinated analogy and so this goes same with you know the mechanistic metaphor or even you know across to other civilizations with the Greeks were, you know, form and matter in a work of art or in a statue you know, has the sort of um, metaphor of uh, you know, metaphysics in each respective epoch. So it's, um, you know, kind of interesting to see how, you know, when metaphysics is eliminated in that sort of sense, how this will implicate, you know, things like ethics, um, and um, you know philosophy uh, in general. Of course, I've always tried to backdrop how you know, Spangler and his metaphysics of history, and how you know these civilizations degrade down. Uh, just as we saw with the Hellenics, you know, there's you know, hundreds, if not thousands, of these schools that develop. Um, and if you know you examine them, you know more closely, you could see how. You know, many of them are uh, in discussions of, uh, well, quite frankly, what will continue on with this video, but, um, you know, skepticism, uh, you know, what we can we really know about, you know, the metaphysics or, or uh, the constitutive reality and um, away from, you know, foundational ideas and these foundational ideas and how they actually transpire a thriving springtime civilization and in the common world even I think you know you could argue that you know with Socratic dialogues and um, you know how the Greeks um, would you know use something like the home or uh, the Iliad or something of that nature um, just as you know the Bible in our you know, Christian infancy of um, you know the West, as a generalization for ethics, for metaphysics, for uh, you know what is good, and so as we see here with the positivists, of course, you know the elimination of these metaphysics and what that will mean for uh, ethical thinking. But you know, I think it's kind of interesting to not to see what happens with metaphysics after this text. But, um, you know, historically, what that has meant for civilizations in the social aspect as well. And so, if we're going to continue, though, with uh, Ayer here, Ayer clearly rejects, you know, no intellectual, you know, foundationalism or first axioms that are propositionally true. But what about the criteria of verifiability? And so, for his criteria, you take, you know, the significance, the meaning of, you know, sentences uh, in language, and um, you make an analysis out of, you know, the proposition in, you know, proportion to what it is factually. Uh, in other words, is this capable of being meaningful in a cognitive sense? Uh, is it factual or does it you know, refer to anything um, to, in order to be verified in that sort of sense? Uh, and as for weak verification, is it amendable uh, to any support from you know, any sort of empirical data to then you know, be used within the analysis? Is it you know, cognitive or is it not? And so, by eliminating metaphysics, as he did in the earlier chapter, he's setting the stage for what philosophy should really be about. 
to him with regards to, as we saw, really a dichotomy form in the century or so prior to him. Um, you know, the speculation, uh, the speculative uh, metaphysical systems uh, as opposed to uh, critique. Um, and of course, both of these um, you know, uh, really axioms, if you will, or uh, the binary of these uh, within philosophy in that last century, you know, goes back much further than that of speculative and um, critical. And so uh, the analytic uh, philosopher really uh, in his sharpening of the tools uh, of the critical, A.J. Ayer similarly is trying to set a critical philosophy uh, as we saw you know, through the likes, of course, with the Socratic dialogues going all the way back to Plato towards Kant's uh, critical philosophy and his response to empiricism uh, with Hume and his critics. Um, and so you could see this, uh, this real, you know, line of thinking, uh, throughout, uh, a history of philosophy here. Um, but he wants to, of course, do away with speculation and simply keep it in an analytical function and we'll go on with there. Um, and so for air, there's, you know, no factual philosophical propositions uh, therefore it has to strictly be in an analytical um, purpose and he wants to do that through uh, the definitional usage uh, within words and their meaning and how a philosopher can you know use this analysis towards um, truth and you know what needs to be constitutive uh, or what constitutes if you will what uh, a truthful pro proposition given forth actually is and so of course with you know incorrect definitional usages as Ayer would point out you know there's logical consequences of um, definitions and philosophy's job is to account for that and so the sentences of, of, of meaning um, for air can be translated into uh, equivalent equivalent statements or equivalence and so the logical equivalence uh, which contains what is uh, to be defined um, or which uh, which contain neither actually what is to be defined sorry I misspoke there uh, or the synonyms which would uh, be defined with it. And so the example he would point to is the author of Waverly was Scotch. And so the equivalence can be found in what Bertrand Russell put forth with his description uh, um, theory and you know, how do you analyze that. Uh, and so if we were going to put it into logical uh, constituents, one person wrote Waverly and that person was Scotch. And so this opens up um, you know, meaning within the sentence. And so you have statements accessible then for verification purposes through uh, logical uh, analysis uh, by that sort of opening up of you know, finding uh, sentence equivalence there. And so this leads into another philosophical uh, inquiry with regards to perception. And so sentences then about material body uh, translated into sentences about sense data uh, is a classic problem of reduction to sense content of those material things. You know, this is a classic uh, discussion of whether or not our sense data or perception and how uh, you know, it, it could actually mislead us with you know Plato of course um, and you know what is that relationship of you know, capturing you know, material body 
uh, experience and putting it into a uh, proposition. Um, you know, is it one to one? Uh, there's you know the phenomenalist and the realist dichotomy here coming through in the early 20th century with perception. And so is something like spatial occupancy contained within the sense data perceived, such as you know with Locke and Berkeley's discussions on you know uh, qualities and color, size and shape, are they you know purely subjective? Or are we at some point, you know, actually seeing, you know, the bare, uh, you know, occupancy, uh, you know, the bare apprehension of, you know, what actually is this surface area of a material thing? And um, for some of the positivists, uh, just to, you know, as an aside, this sort of debate of reduction of material objects to sense data statements uh, can never actually be completed and that goes into ostensive statements uh, which are empirical statements uh, self-contained um, also has to be questioned with regards to what the early positivists were attempting to accomplish with that sort of one-to-one -one, um, look at uh, empirical sense data. You know, what is actually left out? What is the remainder uh, after its linguistic use? And so turning to the mind-body problem, um, the mind-body in their mental statements, uh, can that be translated then into actual brain statements uh, and the sort of physicalist uh, interpretation of, of mind where you know the materialist eliminates mind as a sort of metaphysical entity uh, as well as language about mind or self in its reference of you know I statements of the mind uh, you know, when this actually is transcribed into statements, what happens to the subjective basis of the mind state itself? You know, when you're proposing, you know, I, um, you know, am seeing the color green or uh, something of that nature. And so the translation of empirical statements in its equivalences uh, can be translated as Whitehead and Russell does into symbolic language. So you're way more likely to get equivalences in those statements when um, you're using symbolism, when you're um, you know, using that as your uh, propositional tool. And so the proposition of logic and mathematics uh, do not own their uh, validity, uh, but discovered in a deductive process but seen necessarily as true in the function of language. So there's a truth necessity to the universal application of something like mathematics um, because we never allow them to be anything else uh, because this would abandon uh, into a uh, contradiction uh, when you're using language in that sort of function then uh, there's a necessity for math uh, as an analytical proposition or tautology uh, that are useful to employ when we're actually using language itself. And so if a proposition is analytic uh, and definitions only in its symbols uh, and therefore the synthetic is only in the facts um, of experience, and so he's trying to, of course, direct us towards definitional usages in philosophy. Uh, so definitions then uh, could be seen as, a, uh, as an application of a logical language. And so as we go along here with truth and probability, uh, he wants to you know, use the example of well, I'm going to use the example of Q is true, 
all we're actually doing in that proposition is asserting Q. Um, another take or example would perhaps be, um, is it true that this video is almost over? Uh, what uh, does it is true actually add to simply the assertion and not in its propositional uh, truth? So in this case, then, it is not something of a cognition statement, but one of a performative utterance of what is true. And so, you know, we see, of course, in the function of civic society and, you know, religious uh, connotations to come with that, with um, you know, something like marriage, the priest declaring, uh, you're now man and wife. He's not, you know, in a propositional truth, but he is performing truth in its utterance of you are now uh, man and, uh, or uh, husband and wife, sorry. A little uh, spacey there for a second. And so this could be used perhaps as uh, the launch pad of, um, ethics and the emotivist view that he's going to uh, bring about. And so, you know, what is left out in the translation of these empirical um, statements or in the uh, performance of, of truth? And so just to reiterate, you know, just as like in the example of, you know, this video is almost over this then sets forth an extra set of linguistic affairs to you know what the video is actually in reference to and so you know what is uh, the reference beyond you know the language of an actual state of affairs is um, something that develops out of AJ Ayer's uh, emotivist uh, view of uh, performance here but if we're going to actually look at what he has to say of ethical language, then he turns to, of course, theology and ethics um, for a sort of logical equivalent of ethical and aesthetic judgment. And he has four different categories for this. And the utterances of uh, ethics are... Um, you know, right to mean uh, what is just, uh, just as the description of moral experience would be, I feel terrible about, uh, you know, whatever it may be. And just as moral virtue in sort of encouraging language would use something like, you know, chin up or head up as it's used today. And then, of course, there's the actual ethical uh, judgments, such as you know, voting for a certain candidate or um, a certain political ideology, um, and voting for that is you know, morally irresponsible or something uh, being declared as unjust. And so... Um, just as he will look through utilitarianism and sociological statements. So, uh, if X is uh, productive of Y's consequences, such as uh, with utilitarianism, then, you know, this is merely a reduction of, um, of morality to a sort of sociological and psychological observance. You're not actually making, um, you know, ethical, uh, truthful propositions, but you are relying on a sort of psychological uh, observation uh, with the utilitarian uh, moral framework. And so it's kind of important to perhaps you know, divorce what emotivist and subjective uh, morality uh, is like because it can be easy to tangle them up. 
And so emotivism away from the subjectivist who, you know, defines, you know, pleasure and, you know, good feelings and what is morally right towards these, this observance of, uh, you know, what is felt and that sort of translation into moral statements into uh, certainly with David Hume's psychology, uh, his moral psychology of, you know, feelings and that sort of you know, subjectiveness. Uh, the emotivist, however, he doesn't believe uh, moral statements can be compacted into a psychological uh, deduction such as, uh, you know, translating these moral statements from, uh, you know, what feels good or what is right. Um, there's no factual, meaningful predicate in, you know, X is uh, productive of Y's consequence. Uh, and X is uh, good only in that sort of explanation of emotion. And so, um, similarly, he will reject uh, empirical... Uh, translations or the intrinsic uh, right and um, you know, wrong moral authority with regards to Kant and the sort of transcendence of, um, of, of there being a sort of right or wrong actually uh, you know out there in morality. Um, Ayer of course rejects this and instead goes to the explanations of uh, emotion. So of course for air, these aren't actual uh, propositions, but uh, emotions uh, expressed of different feelings. Um, and so it could be you know important to you know, look at the differences there between a sort of uh, morale uh, system, uh, out of those things um, but yeah this was just a, a rough shot of uh, what AJ Ayer set out to do with uh, the logical positivists uh, in mid-century here um, in uh, um, language truth and logic and um, yeah I think for the next one we're going to move on towards ordinary language and, of course, the metaphysical implications we talked of earlier with um, ordinary language as a... Well, actually, I'm not sure if I did brush up on this. Um, ordinary language has a sort of metaphysic out of a, uh, of a map work, if you will, by charting all the ways, uh, all the different ways that, you know, ordinary language attempts to apprehend in discussions of whole reality and sort of these conceptual schemes uh, out of it, as we mentioned earlier with some of the different examples of different uh, metaphysical ideas embodied. And so, you know, in language and how it's spoken, what is the theological implications of that and uh, much more with uh, future videos on ordinary language and ethics. But yeah, this is just a rough shot of AJ here. I hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see you for the next one.